Good afternoon. My name is Larry Reed, and I'm the incoming director of the Microcredit Summit campaign. And uh, <laughs> thank you. It's not quite a passing of the torch, but Sam did give me control of the bell ringer here. So this is one of the sessions I enjoy most at the at the summits. It's when we get to hear the institutional action plans of people who are working in the field. Uh, those of you who fill out these action plans for us every year, I want to say thank you. Uh, that's what helps us know what's going on. And this is the time we can hear real stories from people working, what, what is working, what's not working. We can compare notes and look at how we can all do better in implementing our programs and in caring for the poor. We have two speakers with us today presenting their action plans, and I hope all of you received one. You should have received one of these, either in English, French, or Spanish. If you didn't, please raise your hand, and we'll pass it out to you now. Our two speakers today, our second presenter is Lauren Hendricks. Lauren is the executive director of Access Africa, a program of Care USA, and she resides in Tanzania. And our first speaker you've already met on film, he is Gautier Diodone, and he is the director of the Ultra Poor program in Foncose in Haiti. And I'll tell you a little bit about how these will go before uh, Gautier comes up. Each presenter will have 20 minutes to present their action plan to tell what's working, what they're struggling with, and what their plans are for the future. And then after each one, we will have a time for you to present questions. As, as before, you'll need to write those questions down, and uh, we will pick them up, and uh, then I will ask them of, of the panel. So if you, if you have a question as they're presenting, please write it down and be ready to turn it in. So, Gautier, you look great on the big screen. We're looking forward to hearing from you now. Good afternoon. I run the two ultra poor program at Foncose. Foncose is the largest microfinance institution in Haiti. Although it is considered as such, we like to call ourselves an agency to alleviate poverty. Focus was founded in 1994 by a Catholic priest, Father Joseph, with the idea to create a bank where poor women in Haiti could have a bank they can call their own. Those are women who are into the small trading business. We're talking about women who would carry their goods on their heads to go to the local market. Women who would carry their goods in the back of trucks going from town to town, trying to make a living so they can support their family. Those women, they are not welcome in the regular commercial banks. So they, they needed some place where they could do their savings or get a loan. Foncose, with that idea in place, Foncose was, Foncose started with the lots of work, with lots of work from Foncose management. Foncose now has three entities. We have the Foncose Foundation which is where we incubate our branches, and this is where also we run all, all of our nonprofit programs. We also have the Foncose Financial Services. This is the commercial entity in Foncose. We have Foncose USA, which provides us with technical support, look for investors, and also do fundraising for institution. Our mission is to democratize the economy in Haiti, 
by empowering women, rural women in the country, so they could get out of poverty, so they could lift themselves out of poverty. We also, we already started doing it, proving that extreme poverty can be eliminated. And also, we are working so that Haitians can participate in the development of their own country. As of today, Foncose has 46 branches throughout the country. We're still growing. We still have a couple of more branches in the works. By the end of the year, that number will change. Most of our branches are in the rural area. In certain places, we are the only institution, only financial institution providing services to the general public. We have four main programs in Foncosé. We have the Chemel Avimio, which you have just seen the slide, um, the video on it, Path to a Better Life. We have the TKD program, which is the program for the poorest of the poor. You have our main product, which is the solidarity loan. And you have the business development loan. Those are the four main programs that makes our staircase to uh, out of poverty. At the bottom of the staircase, that's where we have our program for the ultra poor. As you can see, those people are way at the bottom of the staircase. This is where we have our program Shemela Vimeo. Our program Shemela Vimeo is a replication of the BRAC targeting the ultra poor program. When we talk about people living in extreme poverty, I mean, you have to understand what that is. It is not just a word. We said, okay, we have seen poverty. All of us have seen poverty, but people living in extreme poverty, seeing it in, it in Haiti is really something. We're talking about people that are living in desperation. They don't even believe that they exist. They're just there. They are shunned by the people in their own community. Even if any programs will get to the community, those people are forgotten. Even when we're doing our selection process, when we are there, sometimes they forget to mention their names uh, when they're giving the names of the people living in the community. But it is our job to find them. Their kids are not going to school. They cannot feed their kids. Where they live, as you can see, as you saw in the video, I mean, some people will not put their animals there. They only live just to eat for that day. All the efforts are put in one thing, just to get the meal for that day. Everything around them, they don't see it. There are certain things that they could do for themselves, but they don't see it because they are so focused on getting the food for the day. It is not that they are incapable of doing anything or they don't have any capacity at all. It's just they don't even think about it. When I started doing this program, when I was going in the field for the first time, <clears throat> what I saw was shocking to me. At the beginning, we had six case managers and I was the one working with them to do final verification, which means I had to be in direct contact with the families. So going from one house to another, there was one sad story after another. Most of those people have been, they, they have lived in this kind of condition for generations. And listening to them tell you their story, as a human being, you can feel it inside. And I was wondering myself, how long would I be able to take that? Would I be able to continue to do this kind of work? Because you, seeing the condition, you're wondering, how can they live in that, that way? 
Well, five years later, I still, I'm still there. You know why? The changes, the transformation. It's unbelievable what I saw with my own eyes. I remember selecting this woman. She was the day of selection and she was like depressed, having her head down, would not look at me in the eye. And uh, I saw her four months later in the program. I was driving by and I saw her on the road. I, I was shocked. It is not the fact that, you know, we provide them with some assets or we're giving them stipends for them to eat better. It's how they feel about themselves. There's this hope on their face. Once they start in the program, like they feel like they're no longer alone. There's somebody there to help them, you know, when they fall down to give them a hand. They finally feel like they, they are somebody. Because where before, I mean, they always said, you know, nobody will listen to me. But now they are trying with our help, with the help of the program, to rejoin society. I remember this woman, after selection process, we do training before we give them the assets. We give them three days training for each enterprise that they have chosen. For six days, I saw a woman wearing that same old dress for six days. And later on, I found out that, you know, the sandal that she had on her feet, she borrowed them from a neighbor. After she graduated from the program, you know, after, after we finished the pilot when we did it in 2007, after she graduated, the program was evaluated and the result was published. After the publication of the results, we had a lot of people coming in to see, is, is it true what we said we did? Is it true? And at that time, we would invite the graduates to come and meet and speak with the visitors. That woman I told you about, she used to always have her head down and I used to tease her. I remember her so well. I used to tease her to make sure that, you know, she lift up her head so she could look at people and talk. At that meeting, and they were asking those women to tell their story. The superstars, they came up and they raised their hand and they told their story. That day I saw that woman, she was wearing a, a nice purple skirt with a matching top, her hair nicely done, nice sandals on her feet. It wasn't just that. What hit me is the fact that that woman stood up and spoke. I almost choked. I just couldn't believe it. She actually got up in front of everybody and spoke. This is what this program is all about. Restoring human dignity. Having people, people to begin to believe in themselves. To help them think that they are like everybody else. They can accomplish anything like everybody else. After the CLM program, she joined our next program, which is the, the TKG program, which is the next step up. The TKG program is for the poorest of the poor. Those are women living in borderline CLM, I call them. But they have, you know, they're a little brighter than the people. They are not as desperate as the one in CLM. But they need help, you know, to take off. So. In the TKG program, we'll provide them with some training, a little accompaniment, and a small loan, and they'll be able to take off. This is a six months program. After six months, they will graduate and join our mainstream uh, solidarity loan. 
the TQAG program is also a solidarity loan. However, to allow those people to join in with dispense of the registration fee and uh, cash collateral that they need to start so we can get them in. But as they're getting ready to graduate, we prepare them so they could join the mainstream to pay the registration fee. After TQAD, you move on to the solidarity loan, which is our mainstream where people come in, people already have activities. And this is also where the TQAD, they graduate into that. We have the CLM graduating into TQAD, then move on to the solidarity loan. And on top, we have the business development loan, which is for small entrepreneurs, small businesses. And it's also where, after people been in solidarity loan for a while, and their business is growing, so they can they have some place to move on, so they can continue to grow. My dream is to be able to see one day a CLM member, an ex-CLM member, be on top there, receiving an individual loan, having their activity. And I know that will happen because those women are relentless. They will get there. For Kose, as of December 31st, 2010, we have 50,638 50, members with loans in their hand. We are working and we know by the end of this year, we should have 60,000 members with loans and, and 80,000 by the end of uh, 2012. Almost all of our clients are women. There's a reason for that. We believe that, you know, in Haiti, that the women, they are the center of the household. They are the center pillar of the household. You give a woman something, you know that, you know, everybody in the family will get something. So this is why we prefer to work with women. And you see that we have a couple of men in there, but this is at the level where they have individual loans, you know, small entrepreneurs, they join in. You know, we want them to be able to develop uh, their businesses so they can create jobs in the rural area. Out of those numbers, two-thirds of our members are living below the poverty line. Apart from our loans, our clients, we've loan, we have people doing savings, they're doing their savings also at the institution. And uh, at the end of December 2010, we had uh, 234,312 passbook savings. And we're expecting to have 270,000 by the end of this year and 300,000 by the end of 2012. As you can see, the average of the loan, uh, the, the savings, they're going down year by year. The reason why is because we are reaching out to the poorest of the poor in the rural area. So their savings, the amount of their savings is lower. But we're getting more people to do savings, but the average will keep going down. We also provide life insurance for our members. The life insurance is not only pay for the balance of the loan, but also provide the family with a little fund so they could help with the burial. Haiti is a disaster prone country. So after a few disasters, we realized that, you know, at any moment, any of our clients or members could be wiped out. So we came up with the disaster loan. So if something happens, they'll be able to not only get exonerated for their loans, but also get a little something to get them started. And plus, a second loan, uh, uh, another loan once they are ready to, to start working again. We have remittances. I like to match that with uh, currency exchange. Remittances is one of big business in Haiti. We have a lot of agencies doing remittances. And we do that. And we are in the rural area where most of those agencies are, do not exist. 
after the earthquake, all of the commercial banks were closed. If all the institutions were closed, our building was destroyed, our main branch in Port au Prince was destroyed. Everybody was scrambling to know what to do. Foncosé, right after the earthquake, we were thinking about our members, our clients. In our own backyard, we made a makeshift office to make sure that our server was operational. So because we know that Haitians abroad will be sending money to their loved ones in Haiti to help them. That's what happened. There was an influx of remittances. A lot of money transfers coming to Haiti. We were the first institution to open our doors to the general public. And the funny thing is that Central Bank was not open yet. And all of our remittances are paid in U.S. currencies, U.S. dollars. Central Bank didn't have any U.S. dollars to give. So we had to continue operating. Again, my boss and the Foncosi management, they managed to have U.S. dollars flown to Haiti and distributed to our, all of our branches all over the country so that our members, our clients will not suffer. We offer other services like financial literacy to our members, health education, business education, health services directly or indirectly. Health services, we provide that through our partner, especially to our CLM members. Gender empowerment, education on human rights, environmental stewardship, children's rights. I have to tell you a little something about something that came up while we're doing the CLM program. We wanted to include the, the children of the CLM members. Two years ago, we started organizing a, a summer camp. You can imagine that kids in the rural area, very poor family, participating in a summer camp. This is what we did. We organized a three-day summer camp for them where they could all gather together, eat together, play together, and learn together. They learn about themselves, their self-worth, the environment that they live in, and they learn, we, we, we teach them about all, all the social issues that we discuss with their parents, we discuss it with them. Social issues, uh, health issues, the interesting thing about that is that when they get home, if their parents is doing something different than what we taught them, they will remind them that, you know, this is not how it's done. We were taught to do it such and such a way. In order for us to continue to do this kind of work, we have to continue to, we have to, continue to exist. We have to be sustainable. We are working toward that. As of December 31st, 2010, our operational self-sufficiency is at 84%. We're expecting it to be 102% this year and 112 next year. We want to be able to continue to exist so we can continue to do training for our members, do asset transfer to our CLM members and give encouragement, confidence building so they can continue to work and do small trading so they could take care of their family, feed their kids and send their kids to school so that children like those will have a better tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gautier. Thank you for the work that you are doing. If you have a question, please pass it into the center aisle and the, the volunteers will pick it up. And uh, I'll ask the, the first question while they're collecting the others. 
Uh, I want to hear a little bit more about the finances here, the operational self-sufficiency that you talked about. As I understand it, you give an asset and then you provide a stipend to a client, so you're giving things away in this program. So are those included in the operational self-sufficiency and, and how do you pay for that part of the program? Programs like uh, the CLM program and the TKG program, they are grant funded. We get grants to do those kind of program. When I talk about the operation, uh, operational sufficiency, we're talking about our mainstream program, okay. the solidarity loan, the loans, and all the loans we're talking about. All right. So on the, uh, the CLL program, what, to scale that up, then you'll need additional funding to make that happen, is that? Definitely, uh, this is one thing that we need to do. We need to be able to develop strategies so we can raise more funds so we can continue to do this program. And we are hoping to continue to do this because you know that the, we have 40% of the population, bet, uh, between 35 and 40% living in extreme poverty. So we need to continue to do this work. And those people, they can't join our regular microfinance program. So how do you maintain discipline on repayments for people that you gave away things to to begin with? One of the things that we do is that once um, we uh, go into a, a community, we try to identify each member of that community in the level that they are in. So we offer regular loan to them, but one of the things is that we, that even before we start distributing those things, this day what we do, we go into the community and explain to them, you know, the kind of program that we are putting in place, the kind of people that we are working with, and those are the people that they are familiar with, and they know the kind of condition that those people are in. So we said, we have this expression in Haiti that we usually tell them, you have, uh, this is your hand, it's five fingers. Each one of them is different. So we have something for each different group. Okay. So you make a clear distinction. That's why you have graduation from one program to the next, to make a clear distinction between them, right? Exactly. Um, so a good question here that came from the audience. How do you ensure that there's not jealousy? You pick a few people in a community and you don't pick others. So there are some who get things for free and others who get nothing. So. How do you deal with the jealousy that that inspires? Well, like, like I just said, this is what we do. We offer each different group a different product. But we do something else. In the community where we do program like CLM, we have what you call a village committee. We form a village committee. The village committee is there to, not only to help the CLM member, you know, morally or give them moral support, advice, or even help them directly. But also, they are there to help them protect themselves. Hmm. They are like, they play um, as their protector, things like that. So people will not abuse them. Or if people are jealous, talk to them and explain to them, you know, this is, make them understand what the program is all about and also protect the assets because what happened at the beginning of the program, people will be jealous, they will kill, the, uh, if we give the person a goat, they will kill the goats mm -hmm. because of jealousy. Mm -hmm. But this is where the village committee comes in to prevent this kind of thing from happening. Mm. Very good, so you get community support for yeah. helping the poorest in their community. Exactly. Very good. Question about how long it takes. How long does it usually take for a client to go through the CLM Ultra Poor program and move on to the next one? It is an 18 months program after, uh, we said, after launching it. The selection process takes about between two to three months. And right after the, the, the selection process, we start counting. Once they, we, we do asset transfer, we start counting. From there, 18 months onward, so. It's an 18-month prog program, really. And what percentage then make it out after 18 months? After? So what, 
what percentage of people who entered the program move on to the next program? We have, uh, when we did the pilot, uh, our success rate is 96%. Mm. But not all of them joined uh, the next step. Mm -hmm. For the simple reason, it's not because that they don't want to. They have some of them who cannot because uh, for some reason there are certain amount of money that they can manage. Some of them are satisfied with whatever they get mm -hmm. by the end of the 18 months. So they want to just continue to live the way they are and more of them are more ambitious and continue to move on. We have about 70% of them, you know, 70 to 80% they go to the next step. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, well, right after the pilot, 70% move in, moved into the next step. But later on, you'll find some of them, you know, watching the other one evolving, they join in. So mm -hmm. that's why it gets to about 80%. Okay, very good. A uh, question about the impact of your program since the earthquake. Because a lot of us in other parts of the world have heard about failures of programs that have been helping since the earthquake or things not getting through. So is, what has happened since the earthquake with the CLM program? We don't believe in failures. <laughs> That's our thing in CLM. Because for the simple reason, we believe that, you know, once we get into in somebody's life, you're playing with somebody's life. So you can't allow that to happen for them to fail. We still are not at 96%. We started with 150 families. By the end of this year, we'll have about 2,050 families in treatment. We already graduated about 386 families in the program. And we're still at 96% success rate. What happened after the earthquake is that before the earthquake, once you go into a community uh, and you evaluate about 50 households, about, it was about 10% will fall into the CLM category. But after the earthquake, that number has changed. You have a lot of people coming from port au without anything, with just the clothes on their back. Some of them walk for miles to get back to the small town they came from. So that number has jumped from 10% to about between 15 to 18%. So we have more people coming in, and CLM will help them move forward. The only thing is that the fact that they have lived in a big city before, they have the tendency to move faster than mm -hmm. those people who have been living in the rural area all their lives. Okay. Someone is asking about the non-financial services that you provide. I mean, you provide the assets and you provide a stipend, but are there other services you provide to these clients beyond uh, the asset transfers? Yes. You have to understand that, you know, the CLM program what is what we call a holistic program. Those people are deprived of everything. We don't have any government agencies in those areas to provide any kind of services at all. We have to do everything. Health, education, you name it. Some of them we provide them directly, for instance, training. But health services, we, we, we provide it through a partner. Uh, partners in Health, which is where we use, uh, that, that is working, the same area we are working, we make an arrangement with them where they can, uh, where they will provide free health care to all of our CLM members. And we also, uh, you have a case manager there who is constantly uh, educating uh, the, the CLM member, teaching them how to write their names. Uh, discussing uh, social issues, health issues with them all the time. And uh, we help them also to send their kids to school. We want to make sure as part of the program they send all their kids to school. We don't have any funding, education funding in the program, but however, we do advocacy so they can, their kids can join a school. Even they may have difficulties to pay the school fee but however, we will talk to the school principal so they could give it in bits and pieces so the kids can go to school. We have been successful at that. Um, a question on specifics of how you actually distribute these stipends. How, how does someone collect their stipend? Uh, this is something that we do on a weekly basis. The case manager 
because you know it uh, goes to their house and give it to them directly for the month uh, our stipend is about seven dollars for for the week 300 goods seven dollars for the week and uh, the case manager just give it to them directly and have them sign for it as proof that they have received that uh, stipend okay uh, and someone wants some some more numbers from you they they noted you reported operational self-sufficiency they would like to know the financial self-sufficiency for funk jose in 2010 and what you're projecting for the future <laughs> uh, we have some numbers on the website okay <laughs> putting you on the spot here <laughs> yeah they can look up uh, look us up on the website they will get all kind of numbers about our operations and all the figures if somebody's really interested in figures they can get on the website and get all those figures okay so what's that website uh org. okay very good one more question you gave us some inspiring stories about you talked about how what has kept you in this work is seeing the changes in lives what gets you discouraged what makes it hard to to go out and do the work i i, do, I don't get discouraged <laughs> by anything i don't because we believe the team that we have I, I i have to say that i have a very good team a dedicated team we always believe it is our obligation to help those families get out of the situation they're living in so things uh, are difficult mm -hmm. the terrain is rough mud river as you can see on the uh, i mean it's not easy but we know we must do this we have no choice but to do it because there's nobody else doing it if we don't do it those people have no hope thank you thank you Gautier let's thank them for